wrong scripture. Hello everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. By the time you, you see this, it'll be afternoon. Today, Wednesday, August the 23rd, 2023. We're continuing with our series in the Book of Romans. And my last video in the series was in Romans chapter 6. And we were over here we were going to do this chapter in two parts so romans chapter 6 part 1 was last week and we read as far as i believe we ended here in verse 11 likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to god in christ jesus our lord I divided this in two parts because it was just so rich and um, we did a lot of cross-referencing and so a short recap I spent a lot of time on the the scripture that talks about baptism in this portion how we are to be dead to sin and alive to God and the solution ideally for this rebel inside of us is death so that the old man, the carnal nature, which we have have we as a human race have inherited from Adam that has a tendency to sin. The solution for this carnal man or this Adamic nature is death. So that this body of sin might be done away with. And we looked at the scriptures in Colossians chapter 2. It talked about baptism. We went in the book of Galatians also and we went into some gospel verses as well. Because I, I, I pray that I laid out the case for baptism and you were able to understand it according to what the Bible says. I hope that it was clear. If not, we can go over some more scriptures. And to be honest, there were so many more verses that I kind of left out due to time. What I'll do... <clears throat> I was going over those scriptures again this morning while I was preparing for today's part two. So let's do that. Why not? Let's do that. We were talking about, as a recap, before we dive into the remaining of chapter six, as a recap, Paul writes here, he really emphasizes this death and this newness in life. He really does nip it in the bud. He says here, how shall we, so we're up here verse 2 how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it there's no logic logical reason as to how we would continue in sin if we died to it and he's uh, connecting this to baptism the relevance of baptism and its consequences do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into christ jesus were baptized into his death As many of us as were baptised. So this is a practical thing that happened. It was a practical work that the peoples in the early church did. I think it's important that we sort of nip this in the bud. I've said that twice now. <laughs> we need to go into this a bit more, friends. Because I had some feedback and there was a one dear brother in the Lord who did not agree with baptism and even though i presented the scriptures people still have their own beliefs what can you do okay let's go to matthew matthew chapter 3 i i, I brought this up that jesus himself in his humility the man christ jesus humbled himself to be baptised. And he said, when John was like amazed that Jesus was coming to him for baptism, Jesus answered John and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. So my point is, take your argument, put it aside. Our Lord... Jesus Christ, whom we serve, whom we are to identify with in his likeness of his death, his burial, his resurrection, himself 
was baptized, and he said it was to fulfill all righteousness. The early church, the early believers, followed suit. But today, for some reason, human ego and the self will is very stubborn, isn't it? And it requires death. We need to put that thing to death. In Matthew, Mark 16, let's look at the Great Commission, for example. Matthew 16, because you wonder, where did Paul get all this from? Where do you think, friends? Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, here comes the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So belief precedes baptism. It's very obvious. You believe and according to your belief, you carry out your baptism. It's, a, it's your faith in action. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Amazing. The new covenant and the kingdom hit earth with power, with a lot of dunamis power. God backed his word with power, with signs and wonders. But the baptism is commanded he who believes and is baptized will be saved matthew 28 matthew's version of the great commission verse 18 and jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the early church, if you look in the book of Acts, and while we're studying the book of Romans, we are in the book of Romans, no doubt, it's important to look at the book of Acts, or what happened there. It's for these reasons, friends, the church were baptising one another. Jesus commanded it. Let's go in book of Acts. I don't know if I brought this verse up. Chapter 19. Let's read this. <clears throat> Paul at Ephesus. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. This is Asia Minor in Turkey. And finding some disciples, he said to them, please bear with me. There's so much to get through today. I hope you're going to really be edified with this message. I'm going to make a, a big connection here and I'm going to be talking about Islam. So what's that got to do with the book of Romans chapter 6? Would you believe it? There is a very close resemblance and I'm going to share that with you. The Lord helped me to recognize a connection and I'm going to share that with you. The stark difference between the kingdom of Christ and the beast system. I'm going to show you something really, really important. So, hold on. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So, he finds some disciples. He's obviously looking at their behavior, their mannerisms, and he's asking them this question. So, they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? Now, before you jump the gun, and you speak of, this is referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They've just said, they've not even heard that there's such a thing. It was taken for granted. Then what were you baptised into? It was taken for granted that they would be baptised. Nobody was debating it, but we're debating it today. Stop the debates, repent. Humble yourself and go and get baptised by faith. So they said into John's baptism. Hmm. 
What was John's baptism? Can I just ask those of you who still are adamant that we are not required to be baptised by water? When Paul asked them, into what were you baptised, they responded, into John's baptism. What was John's baptism? It was water baptism, was it not? In the River Jordan. To whom Jesus approached and said, permit it to be so. Permit it to be so, to fulfil all righteousness. So, here's his young disciples. Here's the disciples. Never heard of the Holy Spirit. And they said they were baptised into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptised with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, look at the, the speed at which they obeyed when they heard the truth. When they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. Interesting, just like the twelve disciples. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So there you have it. This is recorded for our benefit. It's here for a reason. Very good reason, I would say. In chapter 22, the very person who the Lord chose when he grabbed hold of him while he was on his way to Syria, the very man, Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle, it reads here, Brethren and fathers, Paul's defence at Jerusalem. This is in Acts chapter 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defence before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. They paid attention because he was addressing them in his native tongue. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, that brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren. He was a zealot. He was a radical, a radical Jew, persecuting the church. But while he was doing this, now it happened, as I journeyed and came near Damascus, at about noon, suddenly, a great light from heaven shone around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. I touched on this in my last video regarding the persecuted church. That when the church is persecuted, the Lord takes it personally. People who persecute his people are persecuting Jesus Christ. And there will be consequences for that. And those who are with me, Paul continues, indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? Willing to be immediately obedient to the voice. And the Lord said to me, arise. Go into Damascus and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you. Are you still with me? We're going somewhere. And since I could not see for the glory of that light. <clears throat> being led by the hand of those who are with me, I came into Damascus. He lost his sight. Such was the brightness. And remember what Jesus said. Those who think they can see will be made blind and those who are blind will be given sight. So that is the reason behind his blindness. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, in good standing, this guy, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. 
At that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? And I ask my audience, who have not yet surrendered, humbled themselves, submitted to the authority of Christ and been willing to be baptised by water. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, if it was just enough to be baptised by the Holy Spirit, why on earth was Ananias, who I believe was commanded through vision by the Lord Jesus to go and see Paul, Saul, Paul. And today we are debating it. This is why the book of Romans is so, it takes so much time to really pause and ponder what is revealed to Paul. Remember, he was revealed supernaturally. These revelations that I am reading out to you and people still want to debate it. What can I do, friends? What can we do with such rebelliousness? And that's what it is. There's a stubbornness there and you need to go and work, with, work it out with the Lord. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptised and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He's still giving his testimonial as to what happened. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Why are we waiting? What, what is it we're waiting for? You need a sign, you need a word from the Lord. Here it is. Here's the word from the Lord. Here's your big fat sign. In the book of Ephesians, what verse do I have here? From 4 to 6. Walking in unity. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with the lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace. Why does he say that? Because there is one body, one spirit, just as you, you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Can we say Amen? First Peter going to be thorough with this so I don't have to go back and redo it first Peter chapter 3 verse 21 let's read from verse 18 remember we are we are identifying with Christ Jesus he's our master he's our Lord he's the servant he's our example yes and we long to be closer to him we long to walk a closer walk in fellowship with him. Certainly I'm not the only one. We all want to do this, yes? Let's read together. Verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Absolutely he did. So why do we need to do any works? Please listen to the word of God. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared. Oh, so much I want to say there. I've got to, I don't want to be sort of led into another subject. In which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. This is a type and a shadow. 
Paul is recognizing the type in the shadow. Baptism doesn't save us. This was a type and a shadow. Do you hear me? There's also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Not in the carnal. What can mere water do? It's more than symbolic. Much more. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels, authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And according to the Great Commission, the Lord has commanded those who believe in him, who are baptised, also go and do good works, setting the captives free. But if we've not fulfilled the requirement, what right do we have to demand the Lord give us such gifts? I'm just saying this theoretically, as I understand it. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Is that right? Verses 1 to 3, or was it 13? Here, unity and diversity in one body. So this unites us because we are baptized into Christ, not under some denomination, not under a church. You see this unity. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So the spirit and the water are one. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again by water and by the spirit. So the scriptures, of course they would be, consistent. There's nothing out of the ordinary here. Nothing is contradicting anything. Add the word in Strong's here. <clears throat> We were all baptised into one body. The Strong's is from verse 13. I want you to look at that word in the Greek. What word did it really mean? The Baptist word. To baptise. It, it means water. To dip. To sink. Usage. I dip. Submerge. But suspicious specifically <laughs> of ceremonial dipping baptised. So before we spiritualise these words... Let us understand that baptism by water was a requirement, not a choice today. Or oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Oh, the Lord help you, work that out. Galatians chapter 3, and uh, we're going to look at verse 26. Let's read from 21. Wonderful book, also needing to be read alongside the book of Romans. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And obviously Paul majors on this in the book of Romans, which we've covered in previous chapters. But the scriptures can find all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor, bringing us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. You see how much the New Testament in the New Covenant majors on this theme. Have we missed it? I don't know. But many of us have missed it. For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. If you haven't been baptised, have you put on Christ? Have you shared with him in his sufferings? Have you died, buried yourself and been ro ro raised again in newness of life? Have you? 
What can you say to this? Is it somewhere in the abstract? Or is this practical in your life? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, baptism, whoever you are, whatever your background, brings us all on the same level. Nobody is above anyone else. We have all submitted and surrendered, humbled ourselves to this act of baptism. Now, let's go continue Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also. Likewise. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So now the work that we have to do, the daily walk, requires us to depend on the grace of God and the grace of God is available to those who believe him is entirely the opposite to works of the law if you're doing works of the law keeping rules and regulations grace is not available to you grace becomes available to us when we come to the end of ourselves and we trust entirely and have faith and trust in the Lord Grace then becomes available. This is the power that the Lord gives us because we are walking by faith. We need his help, yes? We are not helping ourselves by doing our own works. That's helping ourselves, depending on the flesh. So we come to the end of ourselves and say, I can't do it. Lord, you can. Therefore, I surrender to you. Then grace becomes available. Grace is another um, wonderful new covenant gifting given to us that is also misunderstood I think especially in those churches that are major on grace I don't think they fully understood it it's not a blanket to continue in sin it's, it's, it's oxymoron it's to give us the strength to endure without doing our own works to help us you understand? Do I even understand what I said? I hope so. Lord, help me. <laughs> Do not present your members as instruments of righteousness. Interesting word. Because when we look at this word instruments, you know, it's related to the word weapons. Our members, this body, the anatomy, the, the whole entire makeup of the human body, the instruments, our weapons. So if we surrender our weapons to the Lord, how mighty will these instruments be used? Now, at this point in this message, we're going to take a turn in talking about this weapon element. Because in the kingdom... You are aware, are you not, that we have entered into a kingdom of light. And it is warfare from the moment you enter it. Why? Because now we are marked. We're marked by the Holy Spirit. And the wicked kingdom of darkness see it. They see the mark of the Spirit. And they go against us because we are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. So now we're going to renew our minds and think of warfare. Kingdom against kingdom. This is warfare now we're talking about. So Paul often uses the words attached to armour, soldiers, warfare, weapons, servitude. To, to get the point across that don't think that this is just a religious walk. This is just in the abstract. This is a spiritual thing. This is a reality and it's a very 
um, a very sobering reality when we realise, when we just pause for a moment and think, let's stop looking at things in the natural and have the mind of Christ, which is spiritual minded. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lust. So after we have reckoned ourselves dead and we've been baptised, we identify with Jesus, we've got to do our diligence in making sure we continue in it. Don't obey this mortal body that you should obey in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments which are weapons of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead as a living sacrifice as he also mentions in other scripture and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace so you see this grace well, I was just saying the grace is the grace of God <clears throat> excuse me is available to us when we have submitted and present our members as instruments to God. Before we were using our instruments, which are really useful weapons, to do works of unrighteousness. But now we give them to God as instruments of righteousness. Now grace becomes available for us to do it. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law but under grace. From slaves of sin to slaves of God. Here we go. Very wonderful to get to this point. Because what the Lord is showing me today, today as I was presenting this, is just eye-opening to me. <clears throat> I knew of this at the time of reading the book of Romans. I, I saw the contrast between the beast of the Antichrist and how he wants to He's seeking a people who will be enslaved to him to do those works of unrighteousness as to counter the kingdom of God. So the beast kingdom is coming to counter the kingdom of Christ with analogies, remarkable similarities. He's seeking slaves. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Of course not. It's absurd. This makes no sense. When people are in a lifestyle, <clears throat> let's say homosexuality, for example, they're in a lifestyle of it, and yet there are people in churches that say, well, the grace of God is abundant, so, you know, it covers it because no one's perfect. No, that's an oxymoron. It makes no logical sense. When we come to the end of sin, end of ourselves, dying to ourselves, grace becomes available. It doesn't become available so we can work it out. No, certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey? This requires an act of the will, willingness to do it, right? So there's a willingness to present yourselves because your mind puts it into gear and then your body follows through with the actions. So what happens? There's no excuse, right? When you present yourself slaves to obey, <clears throat> excuse me, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness but God be thanked there's hope there is hope fear not little flock there is hope but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered and having been set free from sin, read the verses prior to this. What was he talking about?
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So after all this has happened, do we go back to doing what we used to do? No. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Just as Paul talked about the similarities between Adam and Christ and the differences, there's also the same language applied here. There's the similarities of us being slaves to sin and the contrast now in the kingdom is now we are slaves of Christ. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. <laughs> He's, he's trying to make it relatable to the human mind to comprehend this spiritual truth. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So as we were doing that, now let's apply the same attitude to presenting ourselves as slaves to God. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We're coming to the end of this chapter, but there's so much to elaborate on. Just bear with me. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So we are called to be slaves. Yes. To who? Slaves to who? Servant. Okay, let's say servant. If you don't like the word slave, if it if it's too triggering for you, okay. Servant. Who we serve? Who owns us? We are owned by Christ. He purchased us. We don't belong to ourselves. Therefore, we are slaves of Christ. We surrender to him. We only have two options, friends. We can yield, surrender, present ourselves to become slaves of sin. Or we can yield, surrender, present ourselves to become slaves of righteousness. It's only possible through faith. Only possible through faith. So now we see we were slaves of sin. You were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, slaves of God, Pause here for a moment. I want you to meditate on this. Give me two seconds. Now, the kingdom. I want you to remember the book of Acts. So this is movement. There's a lot of supernatural power. Is clearly on display. These people who called themselves Christians are doing the things that Jesus did. The kingdom of darkness has been defeated. What do you suppose the kingdom of darkness has planned to counterattack? Because the kingdom of Christ gave an assault to the kingdom of darkness. He assaulted it, attacked, defeated it. But the kingdom of darkness wants to retaliate. How will he think of the end times retaliate? Because you start with the people. If you can get the people to submit. Look at our governments today. What is their primary goal? Let's be honest. To control the masses. To enslave us. You hear this language all the time. Right? 
They want to enslave humanity, control us, get us to submit certain rules and regulations, confine us. So we become their slaves, right? So the kingdom of darkness. Think of the how cunning the serpent is. What has he done? Well, there's various forms of enslavement in the world today. Addictions of every kind, you name it, is there. But the ultimate beast that the word of God talks to us about. Let's go, Revelation 13. Revelation 13. All the world marveled, followed the beast, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? They surrender to this authority that the dragon has given the beast. These people, friends, become the slaves of the dragon. He owns them. The mark of the beast is symbolic of ownership. The mark of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus on the life of the believer is a sign, is a mark that the Lord owns us. Now, hold on. Did you know Islam you must grasp this truth for a minute. <clears throat> As a former Muslim, ex-Muslim, we all knew this as granted, as common knowledge. Muslims are slaves of Allah. They use the word slave in the Arabic. Slave, if you translate it in English, not servants. Slave. This is showing the tyrant the dominating factor of the beast. Are you with me? Are you tracking with me? You see where I'm going with this? If we did not understand what's revealed to us in the new covenant, we're not going to understand the beast system. We have to go into scriptures in the new covenant that don't talk about the end times to understand the end times. Because Paul, by the revelation that the Lord Jesus gave him, is showing me the nature of the beast. The Christ is the victor. The Antichrist is his enemy. So he's going to counter, try to replace, try to usurp his position. It's foolish, albeit, right? But nevertheless, Satan is going to try to do it. Being a true slave of Allah, go online and look at the contents, go to the sources and there's a plethora of content available for you to see this truth. The heart is inherently dependent on Allah in two ways. Now, think of it this way. If the kingdom of darkness understands this truth, why is the church still struggling with this? I don't want to say that I'm a slave of Christ because it's got connotations with the slave trade or whatever justification excuses we have you are a slave of christ or you are a slave of sin which one is it choose you this day you know why because it's coming a system that is going to enslave mankind now if you're not ready you're going to be enslaved to the system i encourage you and it's my advice to you today to sign up to be a slave of Christ. Believe on him. Confess him. Renounce your past, your sin, your rebellion. Repent. Get baptised. Confess Jesus, the risen Lord. And walk in the grace that is given to us. Start immediately. Time is running out. The hourglass is ticking. The day 
is soon arriving. Soon arriving. And like I say, the beast system, the Antichrist beast system is here. So we don't have a lot of time. Let me read this article from a Muslim sheikh. Look how he's teaching his people about being a slave of Allah. The heart is inherently dependent on Allah two ways. From the point of view of worship, which is the ultimate goal, and from the point of view of seeking his help and relying upon him, which are the means to that end. The heart cannot be sound or succeed or find joy or be happy or feel pleasure or be good or be at peace or find tranquility except by worshipping its Lord, loving him and returning to him. Even if it attains all that it can enjoy of created things, it will not feel at peace or find tranquility. He's laying out the case that we have to be slaves of Allah. We don't have a choice. For if a person is helped to attain what he loves, seeks, desires, wants, but he does not worship Allah, he will never achieve anything but sorrow, regret, suffering. The highest degree of love, the lowest degree, when the heart is attached to the beloved, then becomes sabana, infatuation. When the heart is poured out on the passion, when love never leaves the heart. And when we say that a person is enthralled, as it were, by Allah, it means that he worships Allah because enthrallment is like enslavement to the beloved. Like I said, there's a lot of information on being a slave of Allah. So the system is here seeking slaves for its goals, the goals of the Antichrist beast, because it needs an army. Do you understand? Now, what's the coincidence? We'll go through the scriptures. The kingdom of Christ is similar to that of an army. I will show you the evidence. But first, let me show you a clip. One minute, 52 seconds. Have I got my volume up? Let me just check. Yeah. This is an Islamic video titled Slave of Allah. So the enemy is moving and he's already ahead of us. But he's not outsmarted Jesus Christ because the word of God has shown us his tactics. We have um, secret intelligence, security intelligence revealed to us in the Bible. If we would just read it and heed it, I'm going to play you this video. Check out the scripture. Um, sorry, check out the subtitles because he's, I think he's in Arabic. I am a slave, and my master is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am a free slave, free from the shackles of this dunya. There are many of us, over a billion and growing, alhamdulillah. The message first came in a cave and spread far and wide for all humans to be saved. But this message has been around since the beginning. Adam is my father, Eve is my mother, and Satan is my enemy. And we, the believers, will fight Iblis till the end, inshallah. We are a regimented army who stand up in rows or stand alone five times a day and praise and glorify the one and only Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the words of salvation are La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah There is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad peace be upon him is his messenger Allah is the greatest Allah is the greatest Allah is the greatest Allahu Akbar Allah is the greatest and I am his slave Did you see that? Did you see? Now somebody will say Sonny why are you showing that? Do you not know, friends, in the army, in an army, military, what's the very first thing the military does? The army. It studies its enemy. It studies what is 
the likely scenario when we combat the enemy, right? This is what we're doing here. We are not talking about demonizing Muslims here. If somebody makes that comment, honestly, I'm going to block you. You should have more discernment and you should know me by now. We are talking about the system that has been here to counter the kingdom of Christ. The Antichrist is just that. Against, instead of, to replace, to usurp. So the system is here. The followers who are fervent and zealous, just like Paul was, Saul, when he was persecuting the church, he was a religious zealot willing to die and to kill for what he believed. There are millions of them in the Islamic world today. Millions. I'm not saying thousands. No. Millions. That's the seriousness of the situation. Now, thanks be to God. The Lord Jesus Christ, and this is a fact, he's delivering, saving many of these radical Muslims, the ones who are unashamed of calling themselves slaves of Allah, he's delivering them and he's saving their souls. And now their testimonies are on YouTube, giving glory to Jesus Christ. They've died to self and they are raised in newness of life. Hallelujah. So you've got these slaves of Allah why do you think Satan has set this system up friends to counter what Paul is writing to us here you see this does this make sense now so there is an enslavement coming whether you are enslaved to sin the system the government or you are a slave of Christ we are slaves either to sin or to Christ in the book of Romans we we are just reading from choose today I implore you I can't emphasize this enough the system of the beast is ready to enslave only those who are on the wayside who are undecided who are a little lukewarm who are neither hot neither cold what, what what's going on what's the decision why are you waiting the only freedom that man ever has is when he becomes a slave to jesus christ but there's this slavery available choose this day he who was a slave when he was called by the lord is the lord's freed man Conversely, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I've got some scriptures. I have a lot of scriptures to go through. We're going to do that to understand because a lot of these epistles were penned by Paul. So the one who is writing in Book of Romans wrote elsewhere about the reality of this warfare that we are engaged in. So it would make sense that the beast has a similar tactic he has a military mindset warfare mindset so when the muslim faithful line up as in a barracks in prayer bowing down on the ground to give homage allegiance to the deity that they worship this is to counter the church do we understand this so in every way the beast is a direct challenge to the church. That's why I believe there's a blindness on the church right now in prophecy land who do not see this threat coming. But those who are wise, who are thinking critically, thinking as though we are enlisted as soldiers in an army, are always thinking one step ahead of what the enemy is plotting, of what he's planning to do. We are sharp. We are wise as serpents. Hallelujah. Second Timothy. Look what Paul is writing to Timothy, the young disciple of his, who's now going to start his ministry. 
You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. I feel like reading this whole portion. <sighs> Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Pass on the baton. You know, the uh, athletic relay sport. Pass on the baton. I got the baton. I'm running this race. Now I reach you. I hand it over to you. You continue the race. This is a, an Olympic language. Passing on the baton. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hardship is in this kingdom of warfare. He says, no one engaged in warfare. So we are soldiers enlisted in the kingdom. We are part of an army. We are slaves of Christ. Do you see the picture now? Do you see it? We are one body in Christ. We are a mighty army standing on its feet. And Jesus said to Peter, The gates of hell shall not prevail. Shall not prevail. The church, my darling friends, is never, ever on the defensive. The church is always on the offensive. Remember that. In the book of Ephesians, where Paul talks to us about the armour of God, this is because the church is charging forward. We're not retreating, we're charging forward. But we are covered, we are in armour. And the offensive weapon is... The word of God. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now that video that I played, where did it go? Wherever it went, anyway. He's, he's saying in that video, that Islamic video, that they are an army. They're willing to serve, to be slaves. They are behaving as though they're in a military army. You see their men going out in the streets, praying in the hundreds and thousands. Have you seen churches overflowing, praying in the streets, unashamedly? They might, they might be around, but they're not here in the West, that's for sure. So the church of Jesus Christ has attacked the kingdom of darkness and the darkness is retaliating but the kingdom of light remember always overcomes the kingdom of darkness light exposes darkness darkness can and not and never will overcome the light even in the natural you can be in the darkest room in the darkest cave you light a candle poof the darkness is dispelled that's the power of the light. Okay. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. According to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. Even though he's suffering, he doesn't consider that a defeat, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. The word of God cannot be defeated. It's impossible. Therefore, knowing all this, and being convicted of what we believe, understanding this is a kingdom, understanding we are in a warfare. Therefore, I endure all these hardships, all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And Paul gives a very strong admonition to steer clear of people who argue over daft things. I'm paraphrasing it. 
Steer clear of people who argue over daft things. Irrelevant. Trivial. Nonsense. Shun and pro sh but shun profane idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. I'm skimming through this now because I want to go to other scriptures. But you have it in front of you. You know you can read the full scripture in its context. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this zeal. The Lord knows those who are his. Are you? Are we? Am I his? And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And he speaks this wonderful thing here about becoming vessels to be used in the house for good purposes. First Corinthians. <clears throat> so much to say. Um, 10, am I in chapter 10? First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13. Knowing that we are in a warfare, we're in a battle, we are in the kingdom, we are soldiers. Verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Because temptation trips people up. No temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. But God is faithful, who would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. I see these verses all connected to this warfare, the kingdom that we are in. We are striving against another kingdom. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 and 5. I'm going through my notepad and I want to make sure we go through all the scriptures that are important and related to Romans chapter 6. Because we are slaves of Christ and we are enlisted. Because the beast system is coming, is here and is seeking soldiers to become slaves. It starts with the people. If you can control the people, control the masses, enslave them. Then they will submit, then they will worship and then they will take the mark of the beast. So, now I pour myself and pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... Who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you, when I am present, I may, I may not be bold with that confidence, but which I intend to be bold. Okay. Because people were um, making fun of Paul, saying, oh, when he's present, he's so, he's like, he's a softy. But his letters, he gets so aggressive and so bold. But in person, he's like a feather. He's a featherweight. But he says... For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, flesh, physical, in the natural, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Ephesians 6. Finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God. This is all military language. We are enslaved. We are soldiers who have been enlisted. We are serving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of darkness is at war with us. We are at war. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Read the book of Daniel. Clearly evidenced the kingdom of darkness is always been at war with the kingdom of light. Nothing's changed. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And he gives a list of the helmet. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breast of right, righteousness. Now, bear in mind what that young man was saying in that Islamic video. Bear that in mind and consider that as the counterattack to what the Lord has already commissioned the church to walk in. Gird your waist with the truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, prepare your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, take the shield of faith by which you were able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Somebody's attacking us. Lift up that shield of faith, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. How do you attack the kingdom of darkness? The sword. The offensive weapon. And that is the word of God. And do you know? You may not have read this. I've read it many times. And if you've been listening to my videos, you've heard it many times. <laughs> Romans, I mean, Revelation 19. This is the most interesting book study in the book of Romans don't you think we're going all over the Bible I saw heaven open behold a white horse and he who sat in it was called faithful and true now this king this righteous judge is coming to make war his eyes are like a flame of fire on his head were many crowns he had a name written no one knew except himself he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God this is the same word of God, friends, that we've got to really understand in the spiritual sense, the power of it. It's a part of the armour of God. The word of God is Jesus and he will be manifest as the word of God in the days to come in the future. Oh my Lord, hallelujah. This is so profound, a revelation. And the armies in heaven, whoa, here we go, military language, armies, because we are in an army. <laughs> We're not just the bride of Christ, this, this poor woman who's feeble and needs um, rescuing all the time. The time is coming when the Lord Jesus, the bridegroom, will come and rescue his bride, yes. You see, there's a lot of um, interesting analogies given to us, what has been expressed to us is that we are an entity that is lost without its master its savior its bridegroom we are meant to be one with him but we are in an army i'm all over the place the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen and white and clean followed him on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword we just saw in Ephesians 6, the sword, which is the word of God. Jesus is called the word of God. And through this sharp sword, he's going to strike the nations. He would declare judgments on them. And in some mysterious way, he will also, um, they will also experience the wrath of the lamb, bloodshed. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The word of God is not to be taken lightly. The sword of the Spirit must be welded, friends. It must be implemented daily. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written that no one knew except himself. You know that we overcome in this kingdom by the word of our testimony and by the blood of Jesus. This is how we overcome. In contrast, the Muslim armies, wherever that video went, anyway, whatever this dude is saying, we are in contrast. I'm a free slave, free from the shackles of this world. There are many of us, he says, over a billion and growing. This is the counter-attack. The message first came in a cave. This is a fallen angel and spread far more to all humans. But the message has been round since the beginning. Yes, it has. And that is the serpent. Very cunning. He's been there from the very beginning. I'm coming to the end of my message. Do you want me to give you more scriptures? How are we doing for time? 
<clears throat> I have more scriptures. Hold on. Which one to go to first? Let's go back to the book of Revelation. Revelation 12. Did I read that already? In Revelation 12 verse 11. He's coming to fight us. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. There's been a warfare. He's been cast down. There's constant warfare. So we have to be enslaved to Christ to be enlisted in this kingdom to make sure our backs are covered. Is your back covered? Are you wearing the helmet of salvation? Do you know in whom you've believed? Do you have confidence and assurance? You belong to him. You've met the requirements. Yes, you've been baptised. And you are living for him now. Because I'm telling you, this beast system is coming and it will look for cracks in the armour. Why do you think there's coming a great falling away? The great falling away or the apostasy is coming because there are people who have cracks in their armour or who have fallen away from faith. He's looking for such people. When he gets cast down, he comes with great wrath because he's on a limited time span. So this warfare will be relentless. It will be terrible. More scriptures. John's gospel. Hmm, I have John's gospel here. What does the Lord say here? Let's go. Oh, I'm going too far. John 10. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill and to destroy. An army of the beast comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John chapter 16 verse 33 the Lord says here Jesus answered them do you now believe <sighs> indeed the hour is coming yes and now has come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone and yet I am not alone because the father is with me these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus is the overcomer. He's overcome. So we are not in a kingdom that is anticipating a defeat. You know, you watch sports games, you've got two teams fighting for the trophy, or you've got two nations at war, one is going to inevitably be defeated and one army is going to win. We are not like that kingdom. We are in a kingdom that has triumphed. So it's already won the victory. You see? So we start from the position of victory. Now let's go back and finish this portion. Romans 6. You see where it begins? It becomes with us being obedient to Jesus, being willing to submit, to surrender and to say, I am a slave of Christ. I belong to him. He owns me and he can send me, do with me whatever he wants. That's going to require a lifelong effort. Daily. Because... The Adamic nature, the sinful nature is at war with us and the spirit is at war with it. Later on in this wonderful book of Romans, we will talk about those things. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regarding to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? They didn't bring no fruit, did they, those things in the past? No. 
For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, it's imperative that we are. You have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. James Chapter 4 Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. The only way up is down. You've got to go down in order to be lifted up. This is a warfare. We're in an army. We submit to God. We resist the devil. He will flee from us. Second Thessalonians. We can continue, friends. There's so much scripture about persevering knowing that we are in a kingdom that is at war second Corinth uh, Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3 <clears throat> these are encouraging scriptures so that we know we are not alone but the Lord is faithful verse 3 who will establish you and guard you from the evil one the commander-in-chief, our Lord, the Lord of hosts, goes before us. We are not in a kingdom, friends, that will be defeated. But we are enslaved to Christ. We are enlisted as soldiers. I'm repeating myself so we understand. We we identify with Jesus in as many respects as we can. Lord, help us to walk this out in reality, Lord Jesus. Help us, Father. I want us to read Psalm 91. Look at this powerhouse of a scripture. Then I want to share a lovely song with you. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let me share something personal with you. When my family told me to get out, I knew I was under threat. I knew in my heart I'm under threat. I'm under persecution and what was my natural inclination was to run to the strong tower. I knew I needed protection. <clears throat> I went to the presence of God. I began to memorize Psalm 91 for that reason. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord... <clears throat> He is my refuge and my fortress. Strong tower from the enemy. The battle lines, the army fortresses, are all a part of military language. Kingdom against kingdom. Where is your safety? Where is your security? My God, in him I will trust. Memorise this scripture if you can. The spiritual armour, his truth shall be shall be your shield and buckler. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. In this army, we as a collective, the church, the body of Christ is under attack. Some members more so than others, but we all feel the pain nevertheless. Let's sign up to be enlisted wholeheartedly to Jesus Christ don't be so easily ensnared by the things of this world that don't have no internal significance the song is this one Victoria Oren's My Fortress she's singing the song of Psalm 91 and with that I'm going to end the video 
and I'll see you again with Bible Prophecy Update. There's so much to share with that. Please pray for me, friends. I'm so busy this week. I've been so busy. It takes a lot out of me, in a sense, working online. As you know, I'm working online, trying to earn a living. It's not easy. My goodness gracious, so not easy. Help me, Lord, help me. I'll leave you with this song. I love you guys. I hope this was a great message today. I pray that you were so edified and things began to click, especially with the angle of the beast, understanding what he's looking for. And the system is already here. Okay. Love you. I want you to do me a favor if you want to sing along and rejoice come from the place of knowing that we are in a kingdom that cannot be overcome we are in a, a victorious kingdom friends our army is a mighty army and the Lord of hosts is the commander-in-chief fear not
So before you engage the world, go into your room and say, you are my fortress. I come from a place. You come from a place. So before you go and engage the world, engage that place. You are my fortress. I get back here. I know they walk alone. I know they go alone. You didn't come back. Next week, love you.